When it comes to developing one's character, morals, and discipline, nothing influences you more than the foundation given to you from your parents and the surroundings you grew up in. This is a country to me, you got what you sowed. What you put into it is what you got out of it. Most people were just trying to find, make a living. It was it's hard in every way you did it. There wasn't tons of money. There wasn't tons of things, but it was great people and hardworking people. In many hours we work now, it wasn't half as hard as the hours my dad and them put in, in the coal mines and on the farm. And to me, it's not working. It's, it's, we're blessed to get those opportunities. Today, these mountains of Clarksburg, West Virginia, have become an escape from the sidelines and the demanding world of college football a place where Jimbo can relax, spend time with his family, and reflect on his childhood. I think this brings me back to my roots of where I came from, how you got there, and it lets me be Jimbo again. And I, and I get to just relax and go back to the roots and think why, and then when I get back there, it makes it, it to me, it makes it that much easier to do to have the time I spend here. This has been the house, man. I say I was born, and raised in. Uh, you know, just we. This is this is our community. I mean, we, we grew up on a farm. Always something to do. Always plenty of work to do. And then we had we had a few minutes. We played ball. <laughs> that was basically about it. We played right here, and then we had a big football field down here, and then which was a baseball field. We played in the bottom and had to hit it. Yeah, sometimes you had to run upside of a hill, but that was part of being in West Virginia. Nothing's very flat. But playing ball in the fields with his brother was a privilege growing up with two parents, John James and Gloria Fisher, who instilled hard work in them at a very young age. My dad was a coal miner and a farmer. Mom was a school teacher. And he had something for you to do 24 hours. When he was at work, he had a list of things he had to get done while he was going and got back. And then he had, he had another list when he got there. He was good to them, but he demanded. And he expected them to mind. Uh, when dad spoke, that was law. From the time we were six, seven years old, from whether it was the hayfield or what was the other work here in the garden or farm, you know, Dad believed you had to work. If you didn't work, he told you. And if you didn't do what he said, he tuned your hind end. <laughs> so I mean, always something going on in the farm when you had a farm of this size with cattle and horses and things like that. I mean, 22 acres here, about 250 over there, and then we own another piece of property over here. It's about 80 acres. It ended up being around 350 acres. This was a picture of it when I was a kid, and we talked about the work of how much time and trouble it was to keep that hill completely clean for the cows and all the horses we had up there at that particular time. And, uh, and that was a big part of what we did in keeping our farm clean. That was that was the picture of that same hill right up there right now. See all these fields we usually putting up hay. Where I grew up and putting up hay and putting these fields up right here. A lot of sweat going on in those fields down there. A lot of work. There's some tough jobs in this world, but two of the toughest is being a coal miner and a farmer, and that's what he was. I mean, he was a coal miner at night. He always worked the night shift, midnight shift most of the time, so he could get home and work the farm during the day. And then that would also allow him to see us before he went to work. If we had a ball game or something to see, he was at every ball game. I, never, I, don't, I can't remember hardly ever playing a ball game in my life at any age than that. Here, my mom wasn't at. Jimbo's parents would have plenty to cheer for. Empowered by the work ethic and toughness learned on the farm, he quickly proved a natural in a variety of sports at Liberty High School. My dad always taught me to be a student of the game. He always told people there's gonna be guys bigger, stronger, faster, and it just seemed like if I hit a baseball or threw a baseball or a football or caught it or basketball, it just seemed that it, I could do it. And I loved, and I truly loved doing it. And John James' lessons for his sons didn't stop on the family farm. They carried over to the playing field. And their dad was one of those men that never bragged on them. He always told them what they did wrong, always. He had an adage, he always said, you wanna know how good you are, go talk to your mom and your grandma. <laughs> that, was his, that was his adage, they'll tell you how good you are. I mean, it was a constant, not, I mean, he appreciated, but he always wanted, it was always something to get better at. It was always something to look at. There was always something to improve on. I mean, and it was that, it was a tough love. It was those tough lessons that helped turn Jimbo into a two-time Conference Player of the Year and All-American at Salem College. And in his final year of eligibility, he would transfer down south to Samford College, where he was named Division III National Player of the Year. I believe I had 40 touchdowns as National Player of the Year, and then once I was down there and 
and got into that Southern football, I was hooked forever. And I really started after that 2000, 2001 year, you know, started figuring, you always say, I want to do this, but started saying, you know, I think I can do this. And after serving three years as an offensive coordinator at Florida State, he would get his chance. In 2007, he was named the head coach in waiting and would soon replace the all-time winningest coach in college football. See, everyone thinks I knew the coach in waiting was coming when we went there. I didn't. That was, that was never, that was done after I was there. First thing I asked though when it happened, have you talked to Coach Bowden's is all right. That's the first thing I asked the people who came to me. Terry told me back when he was at Auburn, this guy's gonna be a good one. This guy's something special, you know it? And uh, so I've had my eyes on Jimbo. He's kind of like one of my children. Well, I want to see what made the winningest coach in college football. I wanted to see the way he did things. I wanted to be around him. I thought it was, a, I thought it was the final stamp I needed before I truly became a head coach. And on January 5th, 2010, Jimbo Fisher, the kid from the West Virginia mountains, would officially become the head coach at Florida State. It was just nice to see him succeed because he did work so hard and, and, he, and he's, he's so smart and he studies it and they, you know, he puts the effort into it and, and, it, and it's his passion. My dad came right back out of it. My mom and dad came back, all right, what do you got to get, what do you have to have to be successful? Have a plan, organize, work your tail off, be honest with people, be genuine with people, and be straight up with people. But be Jimbo. Don't try to be Coach Bowden, don't try to be Nick Saban, don't try to be Les Miles, don't try to be Tim. Don't try to be people you're not. Because people don't follow people who are fake. And you have to be who you are. Having already used his blue collar foundation to inspire the Seminoles on field success, Jimbo now aims to pass on the lessons learned from his father to the next generation. He talks to him about his dad and you know they obviously didn't have the um, opportunity to meet his dad and so he can instill some of the wi wisdom that he learned by bringing him back here and, and letting them see it for their own eyes. And I like bringing my kids back to see where we came from and what you did and you know let them appreciate what they you know things are going on now in their life that there's still a lot of hard work in front of them. Their bond, fostered on numerous trips home to West Virginia, helped them battle one of the greatest challenges a family could face. In the spring of 2011, their youngest son, Ethan, was diagnosed with Fanconi anemia, a rare and deadly blood disorder. There are about 30 children a year who are born with this disease. Um, about one in every 130,000 children have it. It's basically when you and I, when we're exposed to um, outside sources, sun, smoke, those types of things, they do damage in our body. But our bodies go through this process where we repair that damage to the cells. FA children don't have the capability to repair that damage. It's a disease that never leaves you, that eventually he will uh, uh, have a bone marrow transplant. And then uh, it's a disease that he has tremendously high risk of cancer the rest of his life. They are about 500,000 times more likely to get a head or neck cancer than the general population. And if they get one of those cancers, they have about a 50% chance of survival beyond two years. I always remember going back to my family and life's not fair. No one says it's fair, it's not going to be fair. Uh, it's just, uh, you gotta deal with it. All right, now, how are we gonna deal with it? So my dad always says, all right, that's the way. Life's not, wasn't fair when I got blown up in the mind. Wasn't fair when this happened, wasn't fair when, what are you gonna do about it? The Fisher's response? A nonprofit fund called Kids First, which raises money for research and development to fight this deadly disease. That there's a greater plan for me being the head football coach at Florida State than just being the football coach. That there's something even greater. And if we can become great football coaches, develop our players, develop our, our student athletes, let them have better lives, and be able to take this platform and, and, and beat a disease, there's not a greater calling in life.
And while the family's fight against Fanconi anemia is an everyday battle, alongside running one of college football's most dominant programs, Jimbo still finds peace in these mountains, a place that molded him, where life is just simple. He gets to get away from, from that environment for a while, and that's, that's, a good, that's a good place for him, and it, and it helps him find balance. Getting to be me again, and remembering all the, the basics in life that, that got us started and how fortunate I am to be doing what I'm doing. When I had those dreams as a little kid, being able to do the things I'm doing now and I'm doing them, it kind of brings me back to reality and reminds me that uh, what hard work really was and, and how the folks here lived and uh, that I'm very blessed to be doing what I'm doing.